Good evening, my name is Mary Watson. I'm Executive Dean at the New School and it's my distinct pleasure um, to be here tonight to welcome Michael Denzel Smith um, and his panelists who I'll introduce in just a moment for our fantastic event on Michael's new book, Invisible Man, Got the Whole World Watching a Young Black Man's Education. Um, so welcome tonight. Um, we are very proud to um, be co-sponsoring this event with um, our partners, the Nation Institute, Nation Books, Public Affairs Books, and The Nation Magazine. We've had a 12-year history of partnering on events with The Nation, and we consider them to be a very valuable and important partner. So before I say a few details about the panelists and the evening's program, I want to say a few words about the New School, where you're seated tonight. Founded, as many of you may know, in 1919, so nearly 100 years ago, this university has always been a different kind of academic institution. It was founded on the idea that uh, individuals, faculty, students, and learners of all kinds should be able to engage freely and openly and directly address the most emergent problems of our contemporary society. Um, this very room in which you're seated tonight um, has, um, has hosted many illustrious uh, speakers and guests, including Dr. Martin Luther King, a junior, on this very stage. So um, right in the stage, I'm quite, quite on a series on um, race relations here at the New School. So nearly 100 years ago, we started as a different kind of university, and now we've changed a bit. We've included um, fields like design and um, social research into our academic repertoire, but it's really still important that we engage a wider audience about issues that matter to society. And in this way, the nation is a great partner for us because they share these common values. And this book is a great uh, book for us to be able to feature because it's really about the kind of discourse that matters here at the New School. So tonight we honor journalist and activist Michael Denzel Smith. Um, his book, Invisible Man, Got the Whole World Watching, A Young, Man's, uh, young Black Man's Education, is a New York Times bestseller and has received extremely high praise from many luminaries, including Melissa Harris Perry and many, many others. Um, now considered one of the country's most prominent young writers on race, Michael is known for challenging the political and cultural scripts for the millennial black manhood. This highly anticipated and unapologetic memoir really delivers an unflinching account of what it means to be a young black man in America today and reflects on Michael's efforts to find his identity in the world that defied his humanity. Since 2004, young black men across uh, America have watched uh, situations like Barack Obama's ascent as president, but they've also witnessed the deaths of so many young black men, Oscar Grant, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, Eric Gardner, and many, many, many more, even as recently as yesterday in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, in this book, um, Michael struggles to reconcile these two vastly different tales of what it means to be a young black man in America, and he explores the spectrum of the opportunities for black men that lie in between. He chronicles both his personal and political education during these tumultuous years. Michael Denzel Smith is a nobler fellow at the Nation Institute and a contributing writer for the Nation magazine. He has also written for the New York Times, The Atlantic, Salon, The Guardian, The Root, The Grio, Think Progress, and The Huffington Post, and has been a featured commentator on NPR, BBC Radio, CNN, MSNBC, Al Jazeera America, HuffPost Live, and a number of other radio and television programs. And I should probably stop to quip here that that was just in the last week. Is that right, Michael? Because you've been very, very busy. Um, Joining Michael tonight in this conversation are uh, first Rembert Brown, a writer at large for New York Magazine whose writing ranges from pop culture to sports to race and politics. Formerly a staff writer for Grantland, Rembert began working in 2011 there where he hosted also Rembert Explains pod Podcast, the Rembert Explains Podcast. Alexis Coe, the co-host of Presidents Are People Too at Audible and the award-winning author of Alice and Frida Forever, consults on movie adaptations and has contributed as a writer to the New York Times, The New Republic, The Atlantic, Pacific Standard, Elle, Lenny, The Guardian, and many others. She is currently writing a biography on George Washington. I hope Michael will ask him about that. I asked her in the green room, why a biography about George Washington? Um, it's a very interesting response. And this book will be published by Viking Penguin in 2018. Uh, and finally, Tatiana Faz, I'll get this right, Fazli, Fazlalizada, creator of Stop Telling Women to Smile, is an international art series that tackles gender-based street harassment. 
Tatiana has been uh, featured in the New York Times, NPR, and is listed as one of Brooklyn's most influential people by Brooklyn Magazine. Her work has been exhibited across the country and featured on BET and Oxygen, as well as in Spike Lee's feature film, The Sweet Blood of Jesus. So In Invisible Man got the whole world watching. Smith reimagines the script for black manhood, uh, and he unapologetically upends the reigning assumptions about black masculinity. How does one learn to be a black man in America? What will the millennial generation change in the existing scripts for black, for black manhood? And what would America look like if all black boys lived to adulthood? These are the kinds of questions that Michael book, Michael's book will address. And I'm looking very much forward to hearing this, uh, this conversation tonight because Michael's been on tour in many venues as um, uh, being interviewed by others. But tonight, we're going to get to hear him interview others about these themes. So please, round me and give, please join me giving a round of applause for Michael and the panelists. Good evening, uh, thank you uh, for that introduction. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I have been on book uh, promotional tour for about three months now. Uh, and what you, you learn over that time period is that uh, your own voice can be very annoying. Uh, you, uh, I'm, I'm at a point where like people ask questions and I launch into an answer without thinking and it just like spills out of my mouth and I don't uh, and I'm zoning out and uh, it's a little I mean I'm happy for all of the attention I'm happy for all of the book sales uh, but it's it's not as interesting to me at this point uh, to have discussions of the book um, from people who are asking the same questions over and over again. So what I wanted to do uh, when we, we had this idea of doing an event at the New School back before the book came out, I figured at this point I would be interested in talking to some other very smart people, uh, Ann Rembert, uh, about... <laughs> Uh, about the themes that uh, are raised in the book, uh, because uh, there's there's it's, there's so much that I was hoping to tackle, uh, but cannot be done by one person. Um, and and I believe in the idea of fostering community and uh, intellectual conversation among people who uh, I admire and, and want to hear from. Uh, so that was the the idea behind this event tonight. And so the book. Um, is a script. It is, it is uh, for me, I would say, borrowing a phrase from uh, my friend Aisha Siddiqui, it's a survival script. It is about um, the, uh, the, the coming of age for a young black man in a specific time period of American history uh, with the ascent of the nation's first black president and wrestling with everything that comes, uh, everything that comes with that in a time when it's obvious uh, that the existence of the first black president does not end uh, racial uh, oppression and, and white supremacy. Um, but it, what, it, what it means is a lot of attention being played to black men in a way that we're not always accustomed to and like the interior lives of uh, black men being glossed over uh, even with that uh, visibility. And so the, our public discussions get stifled in, uh, in, a, in a way in which we just talk about the survival of black men in the face of white supremacy. And so I wanted to uh, get at how we, how identity is shaped uh, in the crucible of white supremacy and patriarchy and homophobia uh, and daily quotidian violence and um, untreated mental illness and all of the, the different things that, that come along with that. Um, and, and so tonight, uh, I want to hit on some of those themes and just think about because what the book does uh, quite a bit of is take cultural touchstones um, and think about the impact that they have on shaping identity and the, and the way in which we think through particularly black manhood, um, but all of the, the, the tentacles that that has. Um, so tonight, uh, and I 
we discussed this backstage and uh, my panelists are gonna trust me, <laughs> they say, <laughs> and I hope you all will trust me as well, that I want to start with something that I didn't write about in the book, but I think uh, as, as we've sort of revisited this culturally, um, the, the impact that it had on, on identity and shaping identity for black men and also as a country uh, is, is we're just now sort of grappling with. Um, so I wanna to turn to all of you and let's talk about O.J. Simpson. <laughs> Uh, because I, I mean, I haven't watched the, the People vs. OJ, the, the fictionalized account, but I did watch all five parts of uh, the ESPN documentary, Made in America, and I think that that was uh, fascinating to me in the way in which they set the, they set the, the, the context for why we were obsessed with OJ and what that moment was, going, was meaning to us in terms of being out in LA right after the, you know, the LA riots or uprising of the Rodney King, um, but that's after decades upon decades of police violence. This is OJ, the celebrity, the famous black man, uh, who married a white woman in a country still trying to understand and, and walk through uh, black men's sexuality and then the sexual nature of uh, black and white relationships. Um, and then there's domestic violence, there is murder, there's all of these different things. Uh, there's a community uh, that, that wants to, to, to wrestle with this. So there's so much to unpack there that I think are, we're, we're still trying to understand the ripple effects uh, for us. And then there's so much to, to, to before that. Um, but so let's just walk through our own memories a little bit of that time period and what we, what we absorbed about OJ at that time. So let's start down at the end with Alexis. Uh, well, I grew up in LA. And so this was talked about all the time as it was throughout the country. Um, but I had in my recent memory, memories of the riot. Um, and of being told, I was explaining to them, uh, to get under my desk. Um, we weren't near the riots, but like as if it was an earthquake drill. Um, and there was such a lack of understanding of what was going on. But then I do remember during the trial and every, it was on everyone's TV at all times, um, hearing two things that to me didn't seem to go together, um, that he was definitely guilty but he was definitely gonna get off. And nobody seemed to have a problem with that. And as a young girl in you know, middle school, this idea of reconciling that and of justice and, and how it's um, you know, sort of served in different forms. And I think um, then connecting that to, to OJ actually being in jail now is um, it's really illuminating, I think, of our justice system. Tatiana. Yeah, I was, I was a kid. I mean, I guess we all were kids when this was happening in the mid-90s. Um, so I don't remember too much about it then. I do remember my mother and my family um, watching the trials and being very adamant that he was innocent. Um, my mother was also an artist, and she was like a screen printer, so she made t-shirts. And I remember her making a t-shirt with Rodney King's face on it, um, and me wearing it, not knowing anything, having no context. I'm just like wearing this Rodney King shirt, and people were asking me about it, and I was just like, I don't know. I just knew that he was black. <laughs> you know, I knew that you know um, he was black. He was done wrong, and so I was supporting this, right? And so I kind of grew up in that atmosphere of just like being around this family, my mother, who was just so um, black, black, blackness. Uh, but never really talking about her womanness and her womanhood. Um, you know, I, I remember talking about O.J. Simpson or being around O.J. Simpson in this context of him being a black man and we're supporting him because he's a black man, right? Um, but nothing else with that. Um, so, so coming back to this and revisiting O.J.'s story now and as an adult, um, it's much more complicated, it's much more complex. I understand why my mother and, and so many other black people were using him as this kind of representation um, of a black person 
you know, beating the system. But as a woman, I'm, I'm interested in how my mother was looking at it, you know? Like, what, what was her perspective of the abuse there, um, the domestic abuse, the violence? Like, how was she grappling with being a woman and seeing those things? Or was she at all? Um, because I am, right? Like, you know, I, I imagine if I was an adult during that time, I'd probably be like, go OJ too, right? But it would be really complicated for me. Um, so just thinking back about it now, I, I wonder about her complications with that. Yeah, a lot there I wanna come back to, but remember. Yeah, um, you know, I was, I, was, I was recently thinking about him, thinking about Nate Parker, because it's kind of like OJ is the beginning of like chapter one of the story of like I'm, I'm looking forward to Thanksgiving where my whole family's together to have like the Nate Parker discussion because last Thanksgiving was the Cosby discussion. You're looking forward to that. <laughs> and, well, just because like the way the way my Thanksgivings go, it's like 60, like Atlanta black folk in a room, and there's something that pops up that I've been waiting to, you know, get, like, leap out of my bubble and hear like the full spectrum of how black people feel about a polarizing issue, especially about, you know, a hero, you know, and I think OJ is the first example of that that I remember in my life, someone who you can, you can watch people grapple with this struggle of what do you do with a black person that has done something to make, to, to trailblaze for black people, even when you know that probably the the sum of their their doings are negative and positive. It's just like there is some positive, so it's easy to kind of be in denial and forget all the negative because you think that, you know, I feel like OJ was that one moment where we began to realize that, you know, a black man, a black person that did something and got away with it, like we didn't actually like end up with like a check in our mailbox or anything. Like we didn't actually win anything. It was just like he actually got off and we thought that was gonna be, you know, a great, you know, stuck one to the justice system, but then it just ended up kind of being a, an anomaly. You know, things went back to business as usual. And I, I just remember that being, you know, I think there have been a lot of, and a lot of them have been black men, a lot of popular, men who we've wanted to put on, who we've wanted to put on pedestals even when they didn't want to be on these pedestals or even when they shunned these pedestals, which is why the OJ, you know, like the, the great takeaway line from the documentary is him like repeatedly saying, I'm not black, I'm OJ. You know, that's like, that's the, that's the line that slaps you in the face. You're like, wait, why did we like this dude again? You know, so, um, so I think, you know, whether you look at, you know, the, the, the way the community was split during like, Michael Jackson's, you know, child molestation case. You people were like, yo, I mean, there's like that great Chappelle joke where he's like, yo, he made Thriller. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like that. that. So, but see, so this is interesting to me in that, um, you know, OJ wasn't a hero for us, right? Like, like in, in terms of, we didn't grow up watching OJ. He was right? not on like a Black History February yeah, right. <laughs> you bulletin know, board. Like, you know, Never. Um, in that we, we like, <laughs> For like we're at the same age, like that time when we were introduced to OJ, like we didn't have memories of the run. We didn't watch OJ go for two thousand yards. But some like did he become a hero to you in that moment? Like or, like did you like? Because I I can remember like vehemently defending OJ and like have no connection to this man and no no uh, context for why he was so famous and like what what people's defense of him was. But I remember like doing it on that in its sort of way where it's like I don't understand what's happening, but I know that a black man apparently has been done wrong by the system. Well, well the weird thing is like the. Like Cochran became a black hero mm -hmm. in a way that not even like for me, just like in my yeah. universe, it was like Cochran got the black man off. Right. Like we didn't really like, and by we I mean, like, there's never been a, a a moment where I thought of OJ. I mean, being 29, it's like you're you're coming into your own as like a like a cultural consume like a like an ingester of or digester of culture at the same time as like the Bronco chase is happening. So like, like 
the, the Bronco is like one of my early TV memories, you know. So like I didn't I didn't have, but even after that, even after he got off, he never really ascended to to heroism. But I think Cochran became a um, a slightly heroic, like near civil rights character. Uh, and but again, it was still for you know getting off someone that like definitely killed his wife. Yeah. Like he he he, he did. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. But yeah, I, did I, it, I guess but that, that to like um but what I'm getting at in sort of is the the adoption of black heroes like because we feel like they're so few and far between like I know Cochran definitely did but there's there seems to there, there at least there was for like some time period uh, a mythos around OJ in like we could be proud of the fact that he was able to beat this and because the system like had had screwed black men for so long that here is a black man who achieved the sort of wealth necessary to beat the system or wealth and celebrity to be able to beat the system uh, and going to to what Alexis is saying like uh, or mentioned in terms of the the justice system uh, in America not really being geared toward justice right like it's it's not about that at all so so the understanding for for a community and like for uh, particularly young black boys who are watching a figure that like looks like them and people rally around him. Uh, are, we, are we saying like he is a heroic figure in that like in his ability to uh, accrue some type of social capital to be able to beat the system? Yes, I mean I, I think I think ultimately what I think the stage was set for him to be uh, like a true black hero you know mm -hmm. i think you know after he got off he went back to brentwood and yeah like resumed kind of the life he lived before he kind of had garnered all this like black support so it, it didn't really manifest but um itself but most of my earliest memories were like post-trial were this being a good thing mm -hmm. like this being something that like we all deserved and I do remember that being like a, you know, I had my, my childhood, you know, collection of, you know, black male sports or, you know, music or whatever heroes. And I, I could feel that this was supposed to be someone that was, you know, in the, in like the Jordans and other stuff like that. Even, you know, people that did not make any, you know, political, like, you know, statements or anything that right. would, launched them into heroic territory, but this was still someone who had, you know, he had defeated white America. Like that was, that still felt like this is someone I'm supposed to like. Right, and so Tatiana, coming back to um, some, th the, some of the things you're bringing up here, because, I, because this happens so often, right? Like where we establish heroes, like black male heroes that we're supposed to um, root for and against, um, all logic and reason uh, that that puts like that puts black women in a really interesting and precarious situation in which um, rooting for black men who they know and have been uh, they know have been violent they know have done wrong like it's done harm to other people but then understanding the way in which the system railroads black men right like and having to make that choice like what what impact does it have uh for like you're saying uh, as as an adult you would have you would have been like oh yeah oj is guilty like all of that but um we didn't grow up with that, right? <laughs> you know, and so it's it's a, and it feels like maybe there's a shift that happens in the 20 years since OJ, where we're at least more open to this the discussion. Like they're still rallying, right? Like there's still the protection of Bill Cosby. There's still the protection of Nate Parker, but at the very least, we're open to having that dialogue about whether or not uh, 
black women should be called to the fore to be able to, to have to protect abusers. Um, so what, what then, like how does, that, how does that shift happen and what impact does it have on your sense of consciousness for like younger generations? Yeah, I, I think we're seeing that. I think we're seeing that consciousness play out just we're hearing it more because of social media, like we're hearing black women speak up more um, about having these parallel conversations, one where we are addressing the abuse from black men on ourselves, and the other where we are, you know, supporting them and protecting them. But I think that conversation has always been happening, right? It's always been there. Audre Lorde has written about this like years ago, right? So it's always been there. Um, I think we're just being, we're just seeing it more because younger people and more everyday people are having their voices heard um, because of these online spaces that we have. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's where, I think as a black woman, you're kind of grappling with being seen as a black woman and not just either a woman or not just either black, but as a black woman. Because um, when we do talk about blackness and we talk about racism, when we talk about um, supporting and lifting each other up, um, and we talk about black people, black people is always seen as black men, right? Straight black cis men. Um, and as a woman who considers herself a feminist, I feel like whenever I'm having conversations about feminism and women's issues, I always have to be very, very particular um, in identifying people because when you talk about women's issues, it can be seen as a white woman's issues because women are sometimes seen as white, right? Um, and so we're having to like be like, no, there's this intersection here and we are both things. Um, but it's difficult. You know, I, I think about Nate Parker and I think about Bill Cosby and I think about, um, you know, all of these men where you feel the first instinct is to be like, I'm black, right? And I'm fighting for you. Um, I'm fighting for you. Um, Cause we're always fighting for black men all the time. Um, but you know, it's, I, I find it difficult sometimes. Um, you know, I, I walk a lot to like think out ideas. And, and so I was walking around my neighborhood recently and I'm working on this project about whiteness where I'm trying to like figure out ways to identify whiteness and make white people look at themselves. Um, and so I'm just like talking out loud to myself and I'm thinking about racism and whiteness and, and all of that. Um, and then, you know, I get hollered at on the street or harassed on the street um, by one of my neighbors and, and it's just like, I feel like I'm thinking of ways to fight for your freedom, right? Um, and at the same time, you are coming at me and abusing me in a way. And it's something that I think we deal with all the time, every day in our lives. Um, and so looking at somebody like OJ, or these other black men that I named, um, you know, it's, uh, it's difficult and it's challenging, yeah. And so, Alexis, I, I told you that um, when reading your book, I was thinking about OJ. Um, so, so to get people there, like walk them through Alice and Frida's story just a little bit first. I will just to comment on Tatiana's point, yeah. which is that um, black women have always been left out of these two struggles for rights. Um, black women were excluded from early suffrage movements from early women's social clubs. Um, so it, it really was this, like, which group then you're being sort of rejected by, you know, it makes sense um, that you, so Alice and Frida, my first book is about an 1890s murder in Memphis. And it's about this murder that the nation was obsessed with. A 19 year old girl murdered her same sex love, um, a 17 year old. And she admitted, her name was Alice. Alice admitted to killing Frida. Um, and the nation just, I mean, poured into Memphis, Tennessee, and it was the trial of the year. Um, and then immediately it disappeared. Three days after Alice was found um, insane because she wasn't tried for murder, she was tried for insanity, for saying that she loved another woman despite admitting to killing her. Um, three days later, Lizzie Borden in Boston to a, took an ax to her father and stepmother. And it was such a better story for Americans to grab onto. And now, of course, Lizzie Borden is like a strange cult figure um, that 
white women in particular love. And it's bizarre because it, she very clearly did kill her parents. Um, she was acquitted. Alice was not. I mean, asylums are like jails. You also say this in your book. Um, but what's really interesting in terms of justice is Alice was not the only woman to make the news in 1892 Memphis. The other woman was Ida B. Wells. And that was because um, the people's grocery lynching. And what happened, and the reason I think this is, these women are so interesting to juxtapose them for very different things is that no one wanted to see Alice tried for murder. Like the whole community worked together in order to have her tried for insanity. Um, this was talked about in newspapers before, like you could read articles and it seemed like they were prepping the jury who all knew Alice. Everyone was working together. Um, Ida B. Wells, on the other hand, there were open calls for her lynching. Initially, people thought she was a man. There were open calls for her lynching for not committing a single crime, but saying, hey, you say lynching is about protecting white women, and here's this case in which there are no white women involved whatsoever, and it's clearly about economics. Um, and I think that that, again, is, is a really interesting look about you know, who, who, who gets justice. Yeah. Um, so. So I'm thinking about, uh, so it's thinking about OJ in the course of reading your book because like, like you're saying, like Lizzie Borden came along and was like a better story, right? Yeah. And so we like this thing no that perversity. people can, were consumed with like every single day disappears from our record. People are still consumed by OJ Simpson, but is like the undercurrent of race, right? It, is that what carries it here? Is is like is that um, because of the interracial relationship? Like, is it the history of black men, white women, and like the protection of white women uh, that comes to fore? Do you think that that's what helps us to to continue uh, being? interested in this one or like I mean obviously there are other factors there but like is that like the thing that that keeps us uh, keeps us coming back to that and like even in this conversation coming back to it to mine it for all of the the, the cultural cues and context that we that we can I mean I think so I think that when you mention different cases of um, black men who we remember who have been murdered the the men who were gay have fallen out of our, we don't say their names anymore. I think it's so, so that's one reason that if you can simplify the narrative and take out things that um, make, a, you know, same sex love makes a lot of people uncomfortable. So get rid of it, murder fun, and so keep it. Um, I, think, I think that's absolutely right. I think it has to do with um, this, this uh, sort of policing of sexuality, of relationships, um, with justice, with, with sports, um, with worshiping, with the sort of genuflecting and then disappointment. I, I think it's a really complicated issue, but yeah, I think it's, it's definitely it has to do with that relationship, certainly. Yeah, I mean, I still think that, I think one of the reasons it's so fascinating is because we still haven't seen a life like OJ since. Like, I don't, like I, I've had this conversation so many times this year. It's like, name me someone who is like a, a non, white man that was more beloved by like white people than OJ still, like not Barack, and Barack's like number two, you know? It's like, like, o, like OJ, and then, so you have OJ who is the most beloved American in white America, like, and then after the trial becomes loved by a lot of black America. Like, he almost got everyone at some point in his life. Like, that's, that just hasn't happened before. Like, I think it's, and I think the reason his story is so fascinating is because he, in some kind of perverse, like, also sad way, because I, I hate having these moments of feeling sadness for OJ because he just had to he had to carry a lot on his back that I like have gone out of my way not to like I like he <clears throat> you know he had to be like a, a hero at USC like he had to you know in football you know he he 
he had to make, but he also had to make decisions that, you know, thinking about something like Kaepernick, thinking about, you know, our own lives, he had to, he got put in these crossroads decisions where it's like, hey, like, OJ, are you going to be super black right now or are you not? Like, that is a thing that is probably the most relatable part of his story that you can fast forward to right now and the same questions gets, gets asked for <clears throat> um, minorities, black Americans, which is like, okay, something has happened in society. Are you going to be quiet? Are you going to say something over here? Are you going to are you going to say something over there? Like that is that is inherently an unfair thing because not 100% of the population has to deal with that. But these are decisions that oftentimes people have to, you know, like I feel like I make these decisions a lot at in my late 20s, you know. OJ had to make these decisions at like 19 in front of the whole world. That is a that is a bummer. Like that is like that is that, that is something I wouldn't wish on anyone. I'm not making a, an excuse for the rest of his life, but like I feel like at that moment he was just, you know, kind of fucked forever, you know, cuz that began a series of you know, when you don't do it once, then it's harder. You feel like you've been you've shunned you know, your peers and they don't like you and then you feel like you have to double down on this side, you might not even like, it's just like, it's such a, you know, it, it, that case, a lot of other cases, I think one reason that it has been, it, it, it hasn't fully disappeared from the consciousness is because it's a reminder just of how, you know, how hard it is to be black in America. You add a, you add a platform to that, um, that often gets, even trickier, and I think in this in this age of you know the the normal average person having a platform, it all becomes it all becomes super relatable. So I mean, I I, I think the I think the reason something like OJ is still at the forefront of our minds more than things that are happening for the first time now is that it's still unlike anything we've ever seen. Like there, like nothing has been able to tap into so many. I think of the. The, the more taboo aspects of America as like his entire arc. Um, you don't have to answer this question. Is Cam Newton a new OJ? <laughs> I, I typed that tweet out and then I deleted it because uh, <laughs> it, it made me feel real bad. And Cam, you know, Cam's got time to not become OJ. <laughs> he just is, is, um, is on his way. So, so, I mean, it, I think it's pretty clear, like, why I wanted to start there. Um, not Like, I could have picked something that's in the book, um, but I think that this was more fertile for me uh, and more interesting for people uh, to, to sound off on because of its, like, cultural importance uh, and its cultural standing. But also, I th what I think is that coming to that story or, like, being introduced to it uh, at the, sort of early in our lives, the, the way that we were, um, there was an attachment made from other people for us, for in a lot of ways, right? Like, and that was on the basis of the identity markers that we all possess, right? It, 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 like, the reason, um, like, me and my cousins would go around talking about how OJ didn't do it, didn't have anything to do with the facts of the case. It had to do with the fact that like, this was a moment in which people were rallying around a black man publicly, uh, and we were being told, like, this is, this is fighting for you. Like, this, is a, this is something that you're supposed to, to be uh, interested in. This is something that you need to know about because this is potentially going to happen to you in your life, right? And from, uh, like, I'm sure, like, and I don't have the, the, all the context, but I'm sure like young white kids were just being told like here is like exactly what's wrong <laughs> with, with this country. And it's like black people who are celebrating the fact that this man got off for this murder, right? Like it, even if you weren't like being told that explicitly, it's like here's the thing that's happening. And then there's, there's like, again, the position of uh, like feeling like, well, what if, uh, you know, I can recognize the fact that the system railroads black men, but I also want to wrestle with the fact that this was an abusive black man and like all of these different different things. Um, there's, there's different markers of privilege in each position, even from victimhood, right? And I think that that's uh, 
a lot of what I was trying to get at with the book is like, yes, a young black man in America, I am going to feel the pang of white supremacist oppression. How do I wrestle with the rest of it? How do I talk about like the, the fact that that's not the only thing shaping my identity. And what brings you to that moment that you recognize that that privilege, like, like that form of oppression is not the only means by which you experience the world. So I wanna go down the line and like, this, let's say like, is there a moment, because I, you know, all three of you are here not because, uh, not just because I think you're like brilliant people, it's because I recognize in all of your work that you do the work of understanding your own privileged position even in the context of like wanting to write about and explore issues that like maybe reinforce the fact that you are, you're coming from a position of like, uh, that you generally marginalized, right? Uh, so like, is there a moment for each of you where you're awakened to that fact? Like, that, like is there a single moment or is there a process that happens where you understand that um, yes, there are parts of myself that are going to be disparaged, there are parts of myself that are going to be uh, marginalized and oppressed, but there's so many other parts of myself that I haven't been forced to to interrogate that I need to in order to do the work that I want to do? Um, yeah, I think that there were moments, um, for me, I was the granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor, mm -hmm. and I think he didn't talk about it a lot, and the, I, I really had to you know, struggle to get anything out of him, and I, he would answer questions, but he, you know, they would be just one sentence here or there. Um, but what he would uh, express to me left this indelible mark. Um, and I just sort of went through life noticing uh, inequity and um, different systems at play and epistemic injustice and racism and prejudices and um, thought about it a lot and, and just sort of understood that fundamentally, um, you know, sort of a, but like injustice anywhere means, you know, it threatens all of us. Um, and what was really interesting with Alice and Frida with my first book is I was wholly unprepared for the fact that everyone would assume that I was a lesbian. Mm -hmm. Because why would I spend years of my life on these girls? Why would I care? Um, and that just, I thought that was bonkers. Um, and so to me, um, it's this constant, mining my own privilege, mining my own experiences, and constantly being aware that I um, can only say th see things through my eyes and I really need to try and um, challenge other, like challenge that, that lens. Um, yeah, I, I recognize my privileges um, all the time, um, especially in the life that I live today, right now. Um, but you know, it's, it's interesting, when I was reading your book, I started to recognize how I was having some of the same revelations that you were, but I was a girl and I was a woman, right? So your heroes, you mentioned all of them being men up until a point, and those were the same people for me, you know? I listened to hip hop growing up. Um, I participated in, you know, sex shaming other girls. I participated in, you know, being misogynistic to other girls and women. And I didn't realize this growing up, um, just how much patriarchy really instills in everyone, women and girls and men and everyone, um, the ways that we look at gender and look at women um, and look at boys and girls and how they should be. Um, and so when I go into schools now and I work with young girls and I work with um, young boys and we talk about things like sexism and talk about racism, we talk about things like street harassment, I'm always aware um, and recognizing how the girls there um, are also participating in being sexist against their classmates and how they're supporting the boys um, 
but they're also victim blaming themselves and other girls. And so this is something that I'm aware of now, but I was doing the same thing when I was a kid, right? So I think a lot of becoming aware of these things is growing up and evolving. Um, I'm aware now of you know, my privilege being, um, um, having the privilege to travel, having the privilege to use any bathroom or use a woman's bathroom, right? Um, and not having to be in fear of walking into that bathroom that's marked women. Um, and these are things that you just didn't, don't even think about, you know? Um, growing up having, you know, being able to go to college. Um, things that you just don't think about when you're experiencing these things, but you come and you look at it um, and you are aware of that now. And so that influences how you interact with other people. Um, and how you speak and be kind and tender to other people, understanding that um, everything that you have and are able to do and everything you are aware of, um, other people don't have, so. Uh, yeah, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I think I like that saying like mining your privilege. I think it's a, it's a good phrase because I, I remember one time I was writing something and I just like wrote I wrote down, I did, like, wrote a line in the middle of the page and wrote down the things that I thought were things that I was privileged in and the things that made my life super, super hard. And it was, it was very interesting to just kind of see it because uh, a lot of it was stuff that I hadn't really thought about before, you know? So, you know, I, you know, something that made my life very hard in many ways was, you know, growing up with a single mother, like there, that, that just often becomes a, a harder upbringing, you know? I also, um, you know, the older I get, the, the more I realize I think I was very privileged because I dodged a lot of messages that might have come into my home had there been a man around. You know, my, my family is just like a ton of women, most of whom were also single mothers, most of whom who, you know, thought men weren't shit. And so that was like that was like thrown in my face very early, and I and I think in like a positive way, you know, like I didn't my my, my mom didn't surround me with like a, a aggressive male mentors, so like I didn't. There was a lot of a lot of the things that I know some of my good friends had about like what it means to be a man that I think you know messed them up for longer, you know, didn't didn't find their way into my, to my being as quickly or as intimately. So, you know, I take that as a privilege, you know? It's not a, you know, but it's also a reminder that privilege isn't one way or the other. It's, it's not like polar. It's like there's a, you look at most things, like there are some aspects of it that, you know, like the privilege fell your way in other ways that you just read it a different way. And it, it also is a thing that kind of screws you up, you know? I. Uh, I remember, I think, I think I didn't really realize this until I went to college, um, like a, lot of, a lot of the black kids that uh, went to college with me were, were mixed. And it was, you know, growing up in Atlanta, at the time Atlanta was just very much black and white, you know, and most of the black was like, Southern black, you know, descendant of slave black family, you know, just we're all kind of like the same. And in terms of my identity, I've learned as time has gone on that that is a privilege because people question my blackness a lot less than they question someone who, you know, people find out their mom is white, you know, like they have to often go out of their way to prove their blackness if, you know, if they didn't grow up a certain place, or they went to this type of school, or they went to this college, or, you know, like, you know, one of their parents isn't black. Like, there, there's, I've, I've seen this play out with many people very close to me where oftentimes, you know, this is to other black people. They have to overly prove, like, their blackness because they, they're, like, almost starting a little bit more in the red. Then, then, then someone who is just like, you, you can tell me I'm not black, like, I'll just smack you in the face, you know, like, I can do that, you know, that's not fair. Like, and there are many people who that's not even true, it just happens to be 
true with me, but realizing that there was some, you know, I, I feel like growing up, I thought of mix as just like a pure 100% privilege. Like you're mixed, you're light skinned probably, like you, um, you got a white parent, your life's probably easier. The older I've gotten and the more I've like, surrounded myself with, you know, <clears throat> all different types of people that identify as black, you know, you know, continuing to make it clear that it's not like a one, like a group that thinks one way, you know, it, it's a reminder that there is, I have, I have come to terms with some, like the ease at which I can say things, like the ease at which I, I can do something like say the N word or like do like just, I can just be a lot freer. What word? Remember, what word? The, the N word. <laughs> We're at a, a school. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't said the N word in so long. That was nice. Uh, that's a that's a privilege, you know. And I think oh. that, I think there I think there are lots of I think there are lots of very that but that was one I didn't want to give up. Like I didn't want to call myself out on having like black any like type of like black privilege, you know, because it, it feels it feels. It feels weird, but like I, 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 I know that I have sat next to someone who has just like a different family makeup, or is you know not from a hyper black city like Atlanta, or just has a different background, the same smarts, the same views on the world, and there are there are things that I get away with a lot. I get called out a lot less than than they do, and that's that's not something I ever wanted to admit. But that's something I have to remind myself of sometimes. It's a weird privilege. It's interesting. We'll, we'll discuss that some other time. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that one. Uh, some, uh, an intern will be coming around to collect your note cards with questions that you uh, were given, I believe. Uh, and we will address oh, your questions. Uh, were you not given note cards? You're all looking at me oh, perplexed. Damn, like, no cards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Just text. well, you'll get note cards. Uh, you just can write down Michael. questions. <laughs> uh, you can just yell them at Rimbert's face if you want. Yeah, I'll call that. on anyone. <laughs> you don't need cards. Um, and while you're doing that, I'll go back up here. Uh, that's that's something for me to chew on, and I'll, I'll think about yeah. that. A little. You gonna have a boring ass talk? Or you <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I think uh, that's that's sort of the idea of intercommunity privilege, uh, in which the 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 previously subjugated identity uh, becomes some type of privilege within a, a community built as a response to that deprivation is interesting to me. Um, so, something I want to think through. Um, Coming back to it though, uh, so I, I mean, the, you have these moments, you like recognize um, the, the privilege markers of your identity. Um, I'm, I'm curious because also in the book what, um, what I'm trying to work through is twofold, like how, that, how the recognition of privilege changes your relationship to cultural um, products that have influenced you, right? So Tatiana, you're talking about like hip hop and like how the recognition then of, of just how deeply misogynist all of the, the messaging you're receiving from, from that. Uh, for me, it's, it's like, can I still listen to this? <laughs> you know, like, like it, it's that, but there are things that we could, that there are cultural products that we all consumed that were reinforcing our identity and our feeling of place in the world, but then the recognition of privilege forces us to question that. So I'm interested in what, like what cultural products maybe like you've come across or like had to question uh, yourself around on the basis of that, that recognition of privilege um, and how then you have changed your relationship to that or like haven't changed it. Um, but also um, because like what brings you here, what, like what uh, drew me to you is the work, like how does that recognition of privilege show up in the work you do? Well, 
for me, uh, you know, I think specifically of my project, Stop Telling Women to Smile. Um, and it's, it's interesting because I'm an artist who's reflecting the images of other people. So I kind of have this responsibility of how I'm representing someone, um, who I'm choosing to represent, and being careful not to have one person be the kind of representative of a whole group of people. Um, and so as someone who is taking someone's images and using it for their own artistic practice, which is kind of like, I'm just gonna use your face as my artwork. Um, even though the process behind it and the purpose behind it is very well intentioned and I think um, is doing a lot of good, I still have some responsibility there. Um, and so it puts me in this position where I am interviewing people and representing people who are, um, who are poor, who are trans, um, who you know are are young, who are kids, teenagers, um, and so I'm taking their story and I'm taking their image and I'm using it for my own art. And so for me, there's some. I have to I have to sit with that sometimes and understand if I'm, how that works out for me, right? Um, you know, when I put up these posters, you know, I most of the time do it illegally at nighttime. And so, and people wanna go out with me, but I also have to consider that legality factor of it um, and who might be harassed more if we do get stopped by the cops and what that situation would be for them. If I go out with a group of black trans women and we get stopped by the cops, um, that is something I'm thinking about, right? Um, and I know that I would be in the privileged position in that case. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, as someone who represents people and someone who uses people in a sense um, for her artwork, I'm always thinking about my position of privilege. Um, and in the way I, I deal with that is I'm just, I'm thoughtful. You know, I think about it, I care. My intentions are good. I talk to these people. Um, I'm open and I'm honest with them and ask them how they want to be a part of the project um, and how we can work together and it's more of a collaborative experience. Um, I think when you are aware of your privilege, it just comes down to um, being open and honest about it and being a good person with it, you know? Um, it's like black men or it's like, white people <laughs> dealing with me. Um, it's like, recognize your privilege, and then we can come together and do and work together and have open and good, thoughtful conversations together, um, but be real about it, you know? Um, and I think that's what it comes down to. I think that um, I gravitate towards subjects that are, um, Alison Frieda Obscure, but sometimes really familiar. Um, and usually the impetus is that I see some sort of um, fraught relationship or something that seems off to me. And, and so I'm telling a sort of comprehensive history, but I'm going at it through this very specific angle. So for example, I wrote a, a New York Times op-ed um, about FOIA, but I, came to this op-ed, to this idea, because I was trying to um, access Joseph McCarthy's archives. And I wanted um, specifically to learn more about uh, members of the IMF, Intermonetary Fund, that he had gone after. And so it seemed to me that enough time has passed. Um, he doesn't, he has an heir, an adopted daughter. He was only alive for a couple months. Um, after the adoption, she was a baby. Like, it seemed as though they should be public, and they weren't. Um, and I thought that was totally outrageous. And I thought it was outrageous, one, because this is a public servant, so ethically it makes no sense that, that if we pay you for this work that you should be able to mark papers as private, but that's because Congress makes the rules. So when they invented FOIA, they wanted presidential records, they wanted access. So they exempted themselves and, help, and, and held every other department accountable. That's one injustice. The second is that McCarthy, who ruined so many people's lives with abandon, without any evidence whatsoever, he gets to have his records sealed? That's outrageous. And so I think, you know, I just get really worked up in the moment, and that's where the work comes from, and that's, um, luckily define my career is, is I can go wherever I feel passion and usually the passion is rooted um, in some sort of 
injustice or some sort of um, really like complicated feelings like about George Washington. I, I feel like he's the most interesting person and the worst person. Um, and we, you know, that starts with his teeth and, and goes from there. And so, so yeah, I think that's where it comes from. And, and if that comes through in the work, that's, that's great. Um, I think, uh, and I guess this is appropriate for the conversation. I, I think, you know, those moments where you're faced with writing about like one of the, one of the heroes, like one of the black elders, yeah. you know, like that's, it's always like one of those, like, I gotta go like walk around the block, like, you know, have a drink, like just sit and think about like, do I, and this is, you know, this is kind of like the story about like Nate Parker and a lot of other stuff. It's like, do I wanna be the one to call out this person, this older black to some heroic person that has done good for black people? Do I wanna be the one that either begins or adds to the trend of, you know, pulling them down, you know? That's a, there's a privilege in being able to, being in a place where you can, and there is a, it is, it is, it has never been enjoyable, you know? It is, even if it's not like a, someone who's, you know, committed a crime or something like that, like there, there have been moments when, you know, like, things like that surround themselves with like the issues of re respectability politics or stuff like with with Wilmore at the um, at the correspondence dinner you know that was one of those issues that became in, in a in some way a, a, a generational uh, there was a there was a generational split with a lot of people with the response to it a lot of younger black folk thinking that it was you know subversive and important and a conversation started and a lot of older black folk being like you don't do this in front of the president. You don't call the president this, like you don't do that. And I just remember like, you know, having a conversation with a couple other writers, black writers, it was just like like some basically like it was almost one of those moments it was like, who's gonna sit down and, you know, read some of these, you know, older black journalists or like their rights a little bit. Like who's gonna like, you know, th these are people that I, like, I interact with in person, you know, you know, having to, having to then check them a little bit, you know, still slightly respectably, like, you know, respectfully, but still, like, th th those are moments when it's, it, you, d like, you, there's, there's a responsibility, there's an acknowledgement of privilege to being in a place where, I feel like I can do that and not get my whole life ruined. You know, like I don't think that if I say something critical on, you know, an elder of mine that's gonna, you know, blacklist me for the rest of my life. Like there is a privilege because that's not how everyone feels. That's the reason a lot of people are quiet because they don't want the, the backlash. Uh, but I do feel some sort, some sort of you know, responsibility. I see that playing out in my work increasingly the older I get because I know there's like a small part of me that hopes that is there's someone younger than me that is, you know, thinking that critically about how I behave, you know, the older I get and, you know, the, the more with every passing year the privilege only increases, which I think is something that is harder, it has been something to deal with. Like, the privilege isn't going down, the privilege is only going up. So there's almost like a, a constant need to check yourself, like because there, there are some things that will not be privileges ever, but there are other things, there are other gates that are, that are walked through, there are other um, paths that you can now walk down that, you know, for me, we're not there two years ago. So it's, th there is kind of this constant check of one's own privilege that I think if you aren't doing that, you were like doing yourself a, a grand disservice. Um, I think we have questions. Oh, got some cards? Yes. All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
Um, I don't uh, let me let me think about coming back to that. Uh, Was it just like where did you get your Jordans? <laughs> <laughs> uh, here. Okay, well, I'll, I think that to, that's a question for me. There, here's one just to, to get it. What do we do about Don King? <laughs> anyone, want, anyone want to posit a solution for Don King? Uh, I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I was at the Republican convention, and, you know, I was already you know, in, in mid camo mode myself, just like trying to make it through the week as like one of the eight black people in Cleveland. And, <laughs> and I think the last day I saw Don and I've never given someone like a more disrespectful look as I gave him because he, that was, I was like, oh, Don's about to like, Don's gonna do something that's gonna like piss me off in the next couple months and then was that today? Was that yesterday? That was he, today. That was today, guy. It feels like, like three weeks ago. It was today. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Don is stumping for Trump right now. And, um, you know, you know, black people, are, we're complicated people, you know? We are, we are, we are, not, a, we are not a monolith, you know? And in some it's weird, twisted clear. way, I am, I am happy that Don exists to further prove that truth. Um, if he got locked in a room <laughs> forever, <laughs> that wouldn't be the worst thing. I mean, it's, it just, it sucks, because I just, I think it's just like a, the last cry for relevance. Um, and it's real sad, because he's old. But yeah, Don's out here, man. We're talking about Don King. We're talking about Don King. <laughs> which, is, which is, I feel like is a win for Don King. <laughs> Uh, this question, I'm not entirely sure what the question is, but I will throw it to you all. Um, this is, what about someone like Tiger Woods, who did have a civil rights angle to his rise to prominence, and who then struggled with similar problems as OJ? Do we use these figures to create some sort of cultural catharsis? They are chosen for the ways we can extend the idea of what is ideal, and once they are anointed, we commence to take them down. I mean, I, so the, so, is like the thesis of that, like, I almost get it. I mean, what I, I, I think, <laughs> when I think of Tiger Woods and OJ, you know, I guess comparing them and, and putting them kind of in context together or that these are two athletes who uh, are and were superstars. Um, but what seemed to happen was that there seemed to be this acceptance from white America. Like they were like, you know, they were black, but they weren't like black, right? They were like, um, um, accepted by white America because of that. Like they seem to be not completely black. Um, and so their fall from grace, I think is what, is what we're talking about, right? We're talking about how they fell from grace and what that's like for black people to witness something like that. Because on one hand, it's kind of like a lot of black people didn't, I was about to curse, can we curse? I don't know. I already cursed. I'm sorry. Like a lot of black people didn't fuck with OJ, right? Or Tiger um, because of that, because it seemed to be this kind of um, assimilation into this white America and leaving behind black folks, um, marrying white women and things like that. Um, and, and so when they fell from grace, it was kind of like we accepted them. We kind of like, they fell back into our hands um, because they were black, you know? It's always like being down for the black person no matter what. Um, that's what I see when I see Tiger Woods and I think of OJ at the same time. I mean, and we talked about the complexities of that. Um, but yeah, I don't know, I mean, listen, you, I'm not, uh, I'm just going. <laughs> um, wait, wait can, I, can I just say one quick thing? Yeah. I, think, I think it is kind of messed up that we just like left Tiger out the dry a little bit. <laughs> Because 
I, as someone who was just like kind of, I was very, I was very upset. You know, there's that interview where he's like, I'm, you know, I'm Cabaclanasian, you know, <laughs> uh, and I always just wanted to be like, Tiger, just like, I hope before you die, you say you're black once. Um, <laughs> but like, I can't, I can't p throw my identity wishes on him. Right. So like, like Tiger, do Tiger. But like, one, like, black folk did really like, when Tiger, when it was like, oh man, like Tiger might be like the greatest golfer ever. Like we, like t Tiger made it on the, the Black History Month board, <laughs> which is like a like a, a figurative but like a real board mm -hmm. in many many black schools in America. And and I think we we even if he didn't want us, we were able to take him. <laughs> But when Tiger, Tiger come with us, <laughs> yeah, like we like we got Tiger. But when Tiger fell off, because like we didn't feel that he loved us, we were just like we tried and we just like let him go. And so like that's that's the difference. Like that's the difference. Like I feel like we wanted that actually is a similarity. Like we wanted both Tiger and OJ to love us because we were just ready to like bring them on board. So I think when the fall of grace happened, it made it easier to just be like, let's pretend like this never happened, you know? And I think, I think that's, that's a very, you know, you, you throw in, you know, having white wives and everything like that, you know, it becomes even more complicated. But Tiger's in the, in the Smithsonian, the black Smithsonian. OJ's not. <laughs> that's a whole other thing. Um, <laughs> Tiger's been a whole I, uh, Alexis, I'm going to throw this question to you because I think this question is hilarious and I think it's even more funny if I throw this question to you. Right. <laughs> um, is it black privilege to say nigga or is it a recla word reclaimed? Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. I think it's a hilarious question. And I, like, like, do you feel like black people have a privilege when they use that word, Alexis? No. <laughs> No, I think it makes me as um, un you know it makes me as upset as hearing any other word that has been used uh, to oppress people. And actually, you know, I was I've been sitting here like stewing about the Don King question <laughs> because I think that um, as a historian, this is such this is clearly a moment in American history in which it's not even. You shouldn't, it's not even, oh, you shouldn't be supporting Trump. It's like, this is the time to speak out. Yeah. The, the people will always ask me for parallels between this election and past elections. And usually they want like a Hail Mary, you know, like Trump going to Mexico, which I was really surprised by the point bump or something like that. And it's really hard to make connections to the past with this unprecedented election. Usually a Hail Mary is like, you know, Reagan's camp stealing um, Carter's note cards before the election, you know, before the debate. So you could be like, oh, there you go again. Um, but this is this moment in which I haven't heard this sort of talk about Mexico or about immigrants or people of color since like James K. Polk. Since we, yeah. <laughs> this is like Andrew Jackson, and um, and so to me, I, I just, I, I, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling, um, and the normalization of it is frightening for us as a country. Um, I can't even imagine what will happen domestically. People say like it'll be okay, but it won't. Um, internationally, it certainly won't. So. Uh, I'm gonna take this question uh, just because the answer is very brief. I just want you to know that I got your question. Can you talk a bit about Rachel Dolezal? No. <laughs> is she here? <laughs> Did Rachel write that question? Is she here? <laughs> Wait, do you think it's a privilege to be able to say it? The do I think it's a privilege to be able to? I think like, if we're not going to get reparations, let me have that. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I, it's it's like that, that's how bad it is. Sometimes that's how bad. It, that's how bad it is. Because like, if if you if we want to reclaim some shit that you used uh, to denigrate uh, our humanity, uh, and you're going to get mad at us for taking that one word, uh, like, then okay, stop killing us, right? Right? Like. Yeah. That's a trade-off. Like you say it all you want to if the police stop killing us. But it is, it is one of those things that I think, again, goes back to what happened with the OJ 
trial where I, I feel like the OJ trial is like one of like the, the first popular things where that verdict got used to merely like prove points. Mm -hmm. It was like, look, like it was people over here being like, look, like, like y'all treat us this way. Like black folks saying that to white people, white people saying that to black people. Just like that, that, like you can still see that fissure there when, you know, something comes down to, you know, black lives matter, black person gets killed. And then you immediately see people like, like either hoping that there was a gun or hoping that there wasn't a gun because mm -hmm. that then proves a point that then leads, that then beelines to more white people get killed by cops than black people, which proves another, it, it's, there are all these things, like you can use who's allowed to say what, these are all these things that are just, no one really cares about the word. It's just like what you can or can't do, what did or did happen, these are used to prove points about either racism is real or racism is overblown. You know, like those are yeah. pretty much the two big camps of America. It's like, like, like y'all are, y'all are overreacting or y'all aren't, you know, yeah. like that's, that's pretty much where everything stems to. And I think that, I mean, that question, like it's, it's almost, it's, it's one of those things, you know, where it's, yeah. it's trying to prove that point. Um, this question is for me, uh, well, try to address it as best I can. Did you ever grapple with deciding whether or not or how to air dirty laundry about the black community in the book since you knew not only black people would read it? How do you think that through? Uh, I mean, I would object to the idea or the, the phrasing air dirty laundry. Uh, I don't think that one, any of the things that I'm talking about in the book are new. Uh, like if it's dirty laundry, it's like been out there and it's like filthy now. Um, <laughs> Uh, but also just the idea that um, like what that phrase is meant to connote is that it's something that you're not supposed to talk about. Like it's something that you're not supposed to, to grapple with. So yes, if I'm talking about like black folks and respectability politics and like the absorption of, of white supremacy and how that plays out in communities and then talking about homophobia and talking about misogyny and talking about the experience of mental illness and PTSD and depression and all of these different things as if like we're not supposed to talk about those things in public because like, but look at what that's got us, <laughs> right? Like I, I feel like what we, we keep having like similar narratives be written about us over and over again. And at the very least, um, like, what, what the book is talking about is um, an ownership of your complicity within systems of oppression that bestow upon you power and privilege. So that is not airing dirty laundry, that is like owning, owning the responsibility for ending those things. Uh, that is not, that's, that's not to me something that needs to be hidden, that needs to be at the forefront because like, it, if, I'm, if I'm doing that work, that internal work, that interrogation, um, then I'm setting a blueprint for other people to be doing that work, hopefully. Uh, and that's for every position and every identity marker. So if white folks are picking the book up, uh, if they're like, if the, the type of white folks that are gonna pick up the book and believe that I'm just airing dirty laundry, we're never going to be like uh, on my side in the first place, right? Like that's just what it is. Uh, so if, if what you get out of the book is that, then um, maybe I failed as a writer, but but like I like uh, what what I think people have have been getting out of it. What I've been seeing and hearing from people is that um, well, it it, it is a, a reckoning. It is a, a a way for people to see themselves uh, as my like as they walk through my political education. They walk through their own and ask questions about their own sense of self within these systems and how to then extract themselves from the power and privilege therein. So that's uh, what I think as as. Uh, because, I mean, I didn't write it with white folks in mind. Like, I wasn't speaking directly to white folks. I knew they would read it, but I'm not going to let that determine what it is then that I talk about. And, and hopefully, um, the type of people that are engaging this, this work are not going to be the type of people that would simply see it as me, like, doing some type of chastising of black folk uh, 
in in some some weird way. Uh, it is the is the culmination of to this point in my life how I have uh, dealt with these different privileged positions and uh, setting for. 17-year-old uh, black boys that I imagine when I was writing it, the course for how to do that work. Um, uh, here's a short, interesting question. I'm not entirely sure what uh, they want us to get at, but I will throw it to you. Uh, is Obama really different than OJ? <laughs> I wrote that question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, yes. <laughs> I think he's a different person. I, <laughs> that's such a fire question. <laughs> I, I don't... The, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> what else do you have? <laughs> um, another... So what about Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill? I, I think it gets at a lot of the same issues that we're talking about here and like was one of those things early in, in our life and development to, to set the tone for how we would understand these issues later. Because uh, I'm just now like really investing some time in understanding and, and seeing all the things that were happening in that moment. Uh, what about Clarence and Anita, did you? Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's, I, I, I am simultaneously surprised and not surprised given what got attention in my life that that took a back seat to something like OJ, you know? It, it's very reminiscent of what you were saying. It was like, it was, you know, like, Clarence Thomas, like, in, in my life, I was, I was raised to think of him as like it was, it was. He like, was out, like he wasn't a hero, right? He like, wasn't a hero, <laughs> but he wasn't like a villain. Mm -hmm. He just, like I think he occupied a space of like let's try to, even though he is in the highest court of the land, and this is just like the the messaging I'm getting from my my own household, it's like let's just try to kind of forget <laughs> that Clarence Thomas exists, you know. <laughs> And I think that's, that there's, it's complicated because, you know, I think that is happening right before kind of the, the, the bubblings of, you know, a prominence of black Republicans happening, right, right, like coming to power. And, you know, I think a lot of people grappling with what to do with that. You know, it's like, what you, like, are we all supposed to think alike? It's like, are you upset that there are now more black people in Congress just because they're Republicans. Like I, th I think that was, he, he, for me, he was the beginning of not being able to just ignore things that kind of make us uncomfortable based off of, um, and, that, and, that, and that is completely before the stuff with Anita. Like, like mm -hmm. it, that w in my mind, that was supposed to be like kind of his nail in the coffin. Right. But oftentimes, if we've learned, that is not how it happens. Yeah. I think what's really interesting in our consumption of culture that's going on now is how little attention that movie got about Anita Hill and Clarence mm -hmm. Thomas versus our many renditions of the OJ story. Yeah. Um, but I think as I've grown up, and again, this was such a formative case for me about justice where it's like sexual harassment, it was taught to me as something that happens, that you have to handle in a certain way, um, you know, something that, uh, Recently, the, the Trump and, and his sons have described as like Ivanka being too, too powerful. She wouldn't tolerate that. Um, and then to sort of now to understand Anita Hill and to understand what was going on and what, um, how the country really turned against her um, and what she's done since, like so much great work. Um, that to me is also like a very interesting look at justice in America. Yeah, like that, that case was pivotal for talking about sexual harassment in the workplace. And it, when I think of it, I think of less of him and more of her and just, again, how the country treated her like what she had to go through um, and how, what she had to go through after that 
And during that, like I can only imagine the abuse that she was receiving from so many people um, for being honest about what happened to her and going and standing against this man who was going for the highest court in the land, right? Um, yeah, it was, it was when I think of going back to what I was talking about earlier, I don't know if it was so much about race for her specifically. I think this is about my experience of sexual harassment from this man. Um, but it does look at how this woman was treated um, because she was a woman, I think, but also because she was a black woman, like how she was treated for simply being honest about what was happening to her. Um, and it, she is the one who was still dealing with this and still grappling with this years later, whereas Clarence Thomas, you know, it should have been something huge for him, right? But it doesn't seem like it was, um, but it was for her. Um, and I think that that speaks to how women are treated when we are speaking about our experiences, how people try to discredit us and say that we aren't valid whenever we talk about things that happen in our lives. Um, I think that she is a great example of that. I think that she, you know, I went to a talk with her once and someone in the audience asked her, you know, what can I do to, um, to push forward women's issues? What can I do about, you know, pay inequality and all of these huge issues that we're facing? And she answered the question, which is be honest about what's happening in your everyday life. Start with yourself before you try to um, tackle these grand issues. Because that's exactly what she did. This is what happened to me in my life. This man was sexually harassing me in the workplace. She was simply honest about that. And in doing so, she changed so much history. She changed how we look at, and legislation, around sexual harassment in the workplace. And it was huge. And so I, I, I look at that and try to take that and use that in my own life. So when I think about Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill, she really was kind of a force for um, my life and the work that I do now, so. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Rembert, Tassiana, Alexis, for joining me tonight. Please give them a round of applause. Thank all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, I really appreciate that. I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question. I'm kind of sorry if I laughed at your question, but also kind of not. Um, uh, but I do thank you for, for being here, for supporting this book uh, for, and all of the, uh, that I've been trying to do. And as you can see, the conversation is so rich. Um, what I was hoping for is that it's like, a, you know, it's something to, help us think through and then ask more questions. Uh, and I hope that what, that's what you get out of the book uh, and that it's, it doesn't, uh, that we don't end there as if like, because I said something that that's the end of the story. Um, it, it's clearly not, there's so much more to, that we couldn't uh, grapple with here uh, in the time allotted, but there's, the, the, the work continues uh, and so I hope that some of you will continue that work and you will take these conversations forth and, and we will uh, ask, ask more, ask better questions uh, and continue to, to build on that. So thank you all for that. I will be outside uh, signing books and uh, I guess being harassed if that's how you feel now. But uh, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs>